Hello again, my friends. I'm glad you could join me again. So last time we left off with the end of the classical period of music, uh, 1827, with the death of Beethoven. And this week we'll begin with the Romantic period, but I had a few good questions asked this last week that I'd like to uh, post some answers to. One is, what is the difference between an orchestra and a symphony? Well, orchestra is a rather generic term. It just means a collection of players that play different instruments but are playing the same piece. So a chamber orchestra, for example, could be an orchestra of 15 people. A symphonic orchestra, or what we call a symphony, a symphonic orchestra is an orchestra that is large enough to play a symphony. So this is a very large group. Philharmonic, another great one. Literally, the word philharmonic means lover of music, lover of sound. So a philharmonic is uh, similar to a symphony. It's a large orchestra, but a lot of times the philharmonic plays a more popular range of music. Cities sometimes like New York, London, they have uh, the London Symphony as well as the London Philharmonic, New York Symphony as well as the New York Philharmonic. I also had uh, the question, what is an opus? I talked about a, a composer's opus. Well, the word opus means large work. So an opus is a piece of music that is published and consecutively these pieces of music are given a number. So opus one is a composer's first published large work. For example, Chopin Preludes. Uh, Chopin published uh, his Preludes Opus 28. So this was the 28th large work that Chopin published. The first Prelude, the Prelude in C, is Opus 28, number one. The second piece, the Prelude in A minor, is Opus 28, number two. Opus 28, number three, and so on. So opus, large work, number, um, chapter in the book, if you want to think of it that, that way. So let's review a little bit. Uh, Baroque music. Baroque music, 1600 to 1750. Uh, it is uh, prelude and fugue, melody with variations. Um, typically, typically the songs are a little bit repetitive, but have a lot going on in the repetitions, a lot of voices. This is the fugue, for example. That could be the melody, but that fugue will develop that melody into a five minute, six minute work with four voices going at the same time. Uh, Pachelbel's Canon, for example. This is a Baroque piece, and that is the entire song. There's not actually a hummable melody to the piece. That goes over and over, and it simply gets more and more developed with voices carrying uh, variations throughout the, the repetition of the piece. Once you get into classical music, the word for classical, just like in classical architecture, is balance. So classical music, uh, while not typically as formulaically complicated as Baroque music, there is an emphasis still on the melody, but there is also an emphasis on balance. If there is a loud, there is a soft. If there is tension, there is release. If there is minor, there is major. There's dissonance, there's resolution. So classical music has a balance to it. You remember the Beethoven. There's the dissonance, there's the resolution. So balance, classical music. So let's talk about romantic music. Romantic and romanticism are sometimes a misleading term. Um, romantic can mean um, an epic, as in a Roman novel, um, a tale, 
an actual plot tale. So we can have a romance, which is a, a long spun tale, uh, typically based in mythology. Um, you can also have romance, uh, which deals with nature. So uh, a lot of romantic art, a lot of romantic music, uh, a lot of romantic philosophy. Remember the philosophers at the time, transcendentalism uh, had a notion that you could transcend this life through uh, connection to nature. Also, as you would expect romanticism, romantic means uh, exacerbation of emotion. So romantic music dealt with uh, the extremes of emotion. And you get to composers like Richard Wagner that, that had grand scale music, enormous scale. And then you also have composers like Chopin who played, uh, he is said to have played so soft when he played the piano that he almost was inaudible at times. So you have an extreme range of emotions with romantic music. Also to keep in mind, when we say eras, music periods, not everyone in these periods wrote with the style of the period. As I showed last time, Beethoven could write romantic music, beautiful melodies with beautiful themes, but typically he liked to have the balance in his music. Also, romantic composers didn't always write romantic music. Um, and I like to, I like to uh, compare this to saying, what was rock and roll music like in the 1960s? Well, it was the Beatles. Well, it was also the Grateful Dead. Well, it was also Jimi Hendrix. Well, it was also Janis Joplin. Well, it was also Arlo Guthrie. It was also, uh, you get the picture, it was Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young. So if you want to be uh, clear definitions of what was going on in history, that's a very, very hard to find. There were lots of things going on, but we typically want we typically say that this era was dominated by these themes. So romanticism, the melody is extremely important in romanticism. The piano becomes not only a prominent instrument, it is the dominant instrument of romantic music. For, for two reasons. Number one, that's how music developed. Music developed more into the um, the personal realm, that's how philosophy developed. Uh, much more from the grand scale to the personal uh, journey that you have. So music grew from being the symphonic to the extremely personal, uh, and the piano was able to get those emotions. It had developed, it was one of the first instruments that could play loud as well as soft. So you could play an entire piece unaccompanied on the piano. Also in the 19th century, you recall, the piano developed from the harpsichord first, the forte piano, which was the Mozart piano, which um, Beethoven played on. Beethoven didn't actually ever play on a, on a piano as we know it now, a piano forte with a, a, a cast iron harp strong, big instrument. His instrument was still square. It was made of uh, wood. He didn't have metal uh, harps like we do now, so the instrument was not quite as substantial as it is now. But through the 19th century, by the time we're in the 1850s, the piano had developed. Um, so Chopin, immediately after Beethoven, uh, we usually think of Chopin as being the first composer of romantic music, and he was almost exclusively a piano composer. He did write several other pieces, but the vast majority of his music is piano. Uh, Chopin was almost a direct correlation to Edgar Allan Poe. They lived practically the same years 
plus or minus one or two. So that put, gives you some perspective of uh, what, what was happening in America when Chopin was composing uh, in Europe. So next week we'll pick up with Chopin and I'll show you some of the keys of his music and some of the elements of Romanticism. Until next week, peace be with you.